A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the third class on Holbridge's Biographia Literaria and today we will discuss the formative influences on Holbridge. Now we all know that Holbridge was a man of letters and he used to read. He was a very very uh, voracious reader and used to read a lot of books. Now all these uh, books actually helped and influenced Holbridge in forming his theories on imagination and fancy and writing uh, the book Biographia Literaria. But if we uh, actually categorically discuss the influences that were there on Holbridge, you will find that the three main influences were Wordsworth, second is Hartley and the, his associationist psychology and third, the German transcendental and idealistic uh, philosophy of Lessing, Kant, Hegel, uh, Schelling, Schiller, etc. Now, regarding Wordsworth, we can say that Coleridge came in contact with Wordsworth in 1796, quite early in his career, and, and was powerful. He was very, very influenced by this elder poet. Now, the plan of political ballads was evolved as a result of their frequent discussions on, uh, on and exchanges on view. He himself, Coleridge himself, uh, speaks of the influence of Wordsworth on, uh, in, in, in most glowing terms. You can see that how Coleridge actually uh, remembers his meeting with Wordsworth and what was the impact of that meeting on him. Now, Coleridge writes, I must read out, I was in my 24th year when I had the happiness of knowing Mr. Wordsworth particularly, personally, and while memory lasts, I shall hardly forget the sudden effect produced in my mind by his recitation of a manuscript poem which still remains unpublished. So Wordsworth recited an unpublished manuscript poem to Coleridge and Coleridge says that I, I will never forget that experience and it, has a, it had rather a very lasting in, uh, impact on Coleridge and uh, that first meeting. Now Coleridge actually uh, introspects the impact of that meeting. He says it was the union, now he expresses how he feels. So Coleridge was an, as an impressionistic critic and a thinker and, he's, and he now gives the the, the, the impression that Wordsworth had on him. He says, it was the union of deep feeling with profound thought, the fine balance of truth in observing. So he says that it was a union of deep feeling and thought. Neither it was only thought, nor only just emotion, but a combination of feeling and thought and then the fine balance of truth in observing, there was a truthfulness in his observing with the imaginative faculty in modifying the objects observed. So here we get that from his first meeting with Wordsworth, Coleridge, Coleridge actually, uh, actually forms the very idea of how imagination works. Now he says that in modifying the objects observed. So we will find that Coleridge gets his idea that how imagination uh, dissolves, diffuses and dissipates that he will say later, that the very idea came to, into his mind after his first meeting with Wordsworth that, that how the imaginative faculty modifies the objects observed. And above all, the original gift of spreading the tone, the atmosphere, and with it, the depth and height of the ideal world around forms, incidents, and situations for which, for the common view, customs had bedeemed all the lustre had dried up the sparkle and the dewdrops. He says that how Wordsworth actually helped him to see beyond the commonality of the things around that the, 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 the uh, neck breaking uh, usual things that we find, the monotony that we see around, that actually bedeems the luster. And Coleridge feels that Wordsworth and his meeting with Wordsworth actually helped him to see beyond the commonality of the objects observed. So he says, this excellence, which in all, Mr. Wordsworth's writing is more or less 
predominant. So he says that these excellences are predominantly there in the writings of Mr. Wordsworth. So Wordsworth read out uh, an unpublished poem to him and which constitutes the character of his mind. And he says that actually Wordsworth writes his character, that this his writings actually uh, represents the character of his mind. I no sooner felt that I sought to understand. Now, repeated meditations, then further he says that repeated meditations, so he repeatedly meditated on his first meeting, led me first to suspect that fancy and imagination were two distinct and widely different faculties instead of being, according to the general belief, either two names with one meaning or at furthest the lower and higher degree of one and the same power. So he says that with meeting with Wordsworth and his understanding of Wordsworth's nature and the writing that Wordsworth has written and what he read out to him, he actually all these things helped Coleridge to conceive that, that fancy and imagination are two distinctively different things rather uh, rather than being the same thing with different names or the things having higher or lower degree. It is not like that. So his very idea of the difference between fancy and imagination well, that, that, that came to his mind after he met Wordsworth and he experienced his uh, the experience uh, Wordsworth's writings which Wordsworth read out to him, an unpublished manuscript poem. And his understanding of the true character of Wordsworth's mind and the writings. The second influence that was there in Coleridge that, that had influenced Coleridge was the associationist psychology of David Hartley and David Hume. Now, what Coleridge came under the spell of the associationist psychology? Now, uh, uh, before this, we need to know a little bit of associationist psychology and what it wanted to, uh, to, to establish. Now, this associationist psychology, they gave a mechanist view of the formation of human character and personality. So they think that the human character and personality is formed, they are formed mechanically. The mind receives impressions of the external world through the senses. So we receive various experiences, we, we receive various stimulus uh, stimuli from this world through our sense organs. So our sense organs helps us to, to receive impressions. Such sense perceptions, what we receive, they are the perceptions, such sense perceptions, impressions and sensations. So we, what we receive are perceptions, impressions or sensations are compounded by the mind. So there is a as a compounding unit in our mind. So it compounds uh, the mind. The mind compounds that into ideas. And first, a simple idea is formed. Later, the simple idea is processed into a compounded idea of greater complexity. So first, there is a simple idea is formed from the impressions and perceptions and, and, and sensations that we see from the world outside. And from that simple idea, a complex idea, a comparatively complex idea is formed. Okay. Now, the sensations of pleasures get associated in course of time with certain actions and objects. Now, when you do certain actions, your mind feels that this particular action, it makes me happy or it makes me sad. This particular action gives me pain or it, this particular action gives me pleasure or comfort. So when the mind feels that Action A or activity A gives me pleasure and activity B or, act, or, or action B gives me pain. So mind will the, what will the mind decide? Logically, the mind will want to do activity A or action A rather than doing activity B or action B. Until and unless the mind is compelled to do activity B or action B, the mind will never do that. So the mind will always try to do that the mind will always try to undertake those actions. The mind will always try to feel those things, or the mind will try to try to try to deal with those sensations and impressions that 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 make it happy or that gives it pleasure. And doing that repeatedly, this is how our character or habit is formed. This is what the associationists believe. Now, this they say that 
certain pleasures get associated in the course of time with certain actions and objects. Such actions, because they are pleasurable, those actions, because they are pleasurable, the mind wants to repeat that. And repetition makes them habitual. So when you do something repeatedly, you grow a habit of doing that. In this way, what happens is the character of a growing child is formed. The child wants to do certain things which only makes him happy or which only gives him pleasure. Okay. And this is how the habit is formed. In this way, is the character of a growing child is formed. That's only the child, the character of the habit of the child is formed by a sort of wise passiveness. So this wise passiveness is the thing which the associationist psychology want to establish as the main important thing behind the growth and development of a character of a growing child. So this wise passiveness or this passive receptivity to external impression is needed for the growth and development of a character. That, and, and this is how a child grows into a man. Now, according to the associationist theory, then what is that? The human mind or imagination is merely reduced to a passive and inactive recipient of certain impressions and sensations from the outside world. So the mind has nothing to do. The mind only receives that. Your imagination actually compounds that into uh, a, a simple experience and from that simple idea or experience the mind ultimately turns it into a complex idea and certain idea if the mind finds that idea uh, actually is a source of happiness to it that particular idea or that particular experience make the uh, mind happy then the mind will repeat it mind will want to repeat that the mind will want to do that and repeatedly doing something this is how a habit is grown and this growing of habit ultimately forms the character of a child. This is how a child grows into a man. This is how the character is formed. So according to the association psychology, the mind is only a passive recipient. It only has the wise passiveness and the mind has nothing to do. It only receives the uh, passively the impressions, sensations and experiences from the outside world and and that's what it only combines, it compounds it into a simple and then a complex uh, uh, experience or idea. And from that idea, if that idea makes the mind happy or sad, the mind will either do that or the mind will reject that or if the mind won't like to do that. And doing that, this is how the habit is formed. And from that habit formation, the character is formed. This is how a child grows into a man with a passive mind, with a wise passiveness, this is what the associationist psychologists believe. Now, Coleridge had a great, this associationist psychology had a great influence on Coleridge. Now, then what happened? Coleridge undertook a journey to, the, to Germany along with Wordsworth in 1879. So we are now talking about the third category of influence that we see in the, in the works of Coleridge. Now, in, from 1879 to 1880, Wordsworth, uh, Coleridge, was, uh, Coleridge was in Germany along with Wordsworth and Coleridge came under the influence of the German philosophers who took a more active view of imagination. Unlike the association of psychologists, these German philosophers like Kant, Hegel, Schilling, Hegel, Schilling Scheller, so, so uh, they 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 uh, thought that the mind is not an active mind is not a passive receptor, but it has something uh, some activities also to do. The they 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 thought of the mind. They took more active view of imagination. For them, the human mind or imagination is not a mere passive agent. So. Just the opposite of what the associationist psychologists thought about the mind. They, they, they believe that the mind is not a passive agent, but an active and creative power. The mind is an active and creative power. They, now, from influenced by these German philosophers, Coleridge now rejected the associationist view of imagination and subscribed to the Kantian view of asymplastic power. And what is that? Asymplastic power means an active power of power which 
shapes, molds, and recreates. So they already started believing that the mind possesses an asymplastic power which shapes, molds, and recreates. So therefore, the art is not a mere imitation of nature. It is not something like receiving impressions from nature, receiving sensations from nature, and representing that only. It is not like that. Now, it is not just mere presentation of what the mind receives from nature, but the mind is an active agent which shapes, molds, and recreates. Now, art, which is an activity of the mind, is not a mere imitation of nature, but it is a recreation. So beauty, according to their philosophy, is nothing objective. Beauty is subjective. Why? Because in creating beauty, the mind actually does what? It, 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 it works. It, it is active and it molds, recreates and shapes. So your subjective influence is there behind the creation of beauty. So beauty is nothing objective. It is imparted to the external world by the observer. So when you see beauty lies there, they believe that beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. So the subjective presence, the subjective intervention of the observer is important, is very important. In the apprehension of beauty, the soul projects itself into the outer forms of nature. So your soul feels that what the what your eyes are seeing in the outer world, this is beautiful. That's why you feel that it is beautiful. The soul, your soul makes you see the thing beautiful. That's why you see the thing beautiful. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. That means not only the physical eyes, but the eyes that are the eyes that are there in your mind. So that mind also helps you to see the things beautiful or not beautiful. That's why you feel that that particular thing that you see outside this world is beautiful or not beautiful. So your mind is very important. In this way, the external is made internal. So Coleridge does work. He, see, he erases the line, the demarcated line between the external and the internal. And, the, and so the external becomes internal and vice versa. The soul of the artist fuses with the external reality. The artist with his soul gets into, enters into the thing that is there outside. So the soul of the artist fuses with what? With the thing, with the external reality. So fuses with the external reality and transforms and recreates it. So, Ulrich is here giving suggestions of what Sydney also said, that art, poetry, Sydney said that poetry wanted to, poetry always wants to show not the truth, but the ideal truth. So the same thing is there. So in understanding beauty, in appreciating beauty, the mind of the artist, the mind of the sens sensitive person, in enters into that world and sees the world. So the internal and the external fuses and the mind actually recreates, reshapes or remolds the thing that is there in the outside world and presents something ideal, which is the source of beauty. It is the idea which fuses and unites. So we see that Coleridge was influenced by Wordsworth and by the association with psychology and the letter and letter uh, when he visited Germany along with Wordsworth, he was, was greatly influenced by the German philosophers like Kant, Hegel and, and other philosophers who had a very lasting impression just like Wordsworth on whole reach and who actually these philosophies that he, uh, that he, 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 he gathered in his journey to Germany actually helped him to understand the actual activities of imagination, how the mind works and how the mind becomes a source of beauty, how the internal and the external fuses and how beauty is created. So here we end our class on the formative influences on Coleridge and in our next class we will move on to the discussion on fancy and imagination. Thank you.